Hello my friends and welcome back to the rabbit hole. Today's video is going to be quite a different video. We're going to talk about the SPF drama that's been going on in the skincare community, how bias plays a gigantic role in that, and I'm going to do my AM skincare routine. If I look a little tired, I did just roll out of bed. <laughs> Also, if you're clicking this video because you saw Dunginby review, what I'm doing in this video is stealing my own format that I use for makeup reviews. So we're gonna chat for the first half of the video. You can click a timestamp in the description box below that will take you just to the Dunginby review if that is something that you're interested in. But that is indeed what I'm using today in my AM skincare routine. So most of this video, we're gonna talk about this. SPF situation, which I feel like most of you have heard about. Purito is a Korean brand, but they're mostly known on the internet. I actually think they might not be as big of a brand in Korea, more of an online brand. Uh, but they had this sunscreen that was supposedly an SPF of 50, plus, uh, PA++++, plus 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 plus, and it apparently was incredibly cosmetically elegant. For what feels like years, it probably was years, people were raving about this. I had so many people recommend this sunscreen to me. Just absolutely, it was it was a classic in certain skincare circles. Oh, let me give a real quick disclaimer. I almost forgot to do that. So everything in this video is only my opinion. Um, and also, just so you know, I've never tried the sunscreens that we're gonna be talking about, mainly because I have a chemical sunscreen allergy, and even though these were supposed to be newer generation chemical sunscreens, I was just hesitant. You know, if you have an allergy, you tend to be hesitant. And also, because of my allergy, I don't really, I don't really talk about SPF that much on this channel. I've actually had some criticism for that fact, but it's a very simple explanation as to why. You know, I just stick with the mineral sunscreens that I know. I don't really change my sunscreen very often, and what I don't want to do is in any way play into that uh, mentality that chemical sunscreen is dangerous. I don't think it's dangerous. I think that if you have an allergy, you obviously can't use it. So it's, it's made it a very gray area for me, and I've just felt like, you know, it's not my best subject. And by the way, for more reasons than just that, because, you know, the reality is, even though I do have a science background myself, I, maybe because I do have a science background myself, I know that SPF is on another level in terms of complication. Some of these ingredients that we talk about in skincare, especially anything related to nutrition, it's fairly easy for me to, you know, read those scientific papers and understand what's going on with, say, vitamin C, right? You follow me? But with SPF, no, that is a, it's a complicated topic. Topic. So for years on this channel, it's just been something that I leave to the professionals. Now, anyway, back to the story. So what, what happened is there was, somebody did an independent lab test on this sunscreen, right? And instead of coming back with an SPF of 50, I actually think they advertised an SPF of 84. Instead of coming back with that SPF, it came back with an SPF of 19. So following the reports of this SPF 19 situation, Purito handled this really well, at least in my opinion. So, you know, what they did is they pulled their sunscreens from the market. They offered refunds to everybody. It didn't matter who you purchased it from. You were getting a refund if you had bought this sunscreen and they promised to do their own lab testing and come back with the results and see what went wrong which you know in my opinion if a brand owns up to their mistakes completely I'm not gonna hold that against them I do think and we will talk more about this in this video I do think that this really indicates that we need to do more as a skincare community we need to make sure that we are getting the advertised levels of ingredients in our products, but nonetheless, mistakes happen, and if a company owns up to that, I don't really have a problem with that. After all of this Purito news broke, people started to kind of just question Korean sunscreens specifically. Uh, and actually before, but we're gonna talk about that bias situation in a little bit. Uh, so after this broke, people started talking about Claire's in particular. I don't know if we have any developments on Claire's right now, but I do know we have a development on the other brand I'm gonna focus on, and that's the company Keep Cool. But these two companies handled this very, very differently, let me tell you, whereas Purito owned up to it and offered refunds to people who purchased this sunscreen, no matter which company you purchased from. Uh, you know, Purito was saying, we're gonna do further testing, we're gonna figure out what happened here. Instead, the company Keep Cool 
seem to be silencing influencers. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you all here, I don't know a ton about the Keep Cool situation, and in fact, I've never purchased any products from this company myself. However, I know what you all know, which is that there were several people on Instagram who were, who were receiving letters from Keep Cool to uh, not slander the company, which, an opinion is not slander in the United States. Listen, if you take nothing else from this video, know that that is true. In America, you are allowed to have an opinion under free speech, and you know what? Not every country is allowed that. So for all the times where we get upset and frustrated with America and the issues that we do have as a country, we also do have some really great rights. This is kombucha, by the way, how I start my day. <laughs> yeah, should let you know it is in a a wine glass, but it's kombucha. The trilogy flavor for any of you who are really into kombucha. Now, Keep Cool finally posted to their Instagram admitting that there may be some issues with their sunscreen, although they didn't know let us know what, what the SPF level actually is. But it does indeed seem that they have some issues with that sunscreen, so probably they should have listened to those influencers rather than attack them. I think what's really interesting here and what's important to take home here is, you know, I think that uh, the response of a brand is so important. That's the kind of stuff that I really do pay attention to, you know? It's very important to me to see the character of a brand. So uh, let me tell you what, I am not gonna be buying from the company Keep Cool, just my own personal opinion over here, but I'm not interested in buying from a brand that might you know, lash out at me if I say I didn't love their products. No thank you, there are plenty of brands who are very receptive to any kind of feedback. Again, see my Good Molecules video. So, you know, I'd just rather support and talk about brands that are open to feedback and to making their products better. Yeah, right, excellent. I think we are all caught up on the drama, at least the skincare community's drama. There's something going on in the beauty community right now. I think it involves Jeff as well as Trisha Paytas. I have no idea. I have no idea what is going on. I don't think I need to know, to be honest with you, because I've already realized that I'm not gonna support those people, so I'm good. But again, I promise to talk about bias and logical fallacies, and that is indeed what I wanna do, because I think that, you know, this is a huge situation, and I think that bias played a gigantic role in so many elements. Now that you know where we are right now, we can travel back in time and talk about these biases because it is a little bit on the odd side that, you know, this sunscreen that was allegedly a much lower SPF than advertised, none of the influencers caught this, none of the scientists in the skincare community caught this. I think there is a logical fallacy that plays a gigantic role in all of this, and it is called the appeal to authority fallacy. This is a very common fallacy that often comes up in legal situations. Basically what happens is a person determines that someone is an expert or they claim to be an expert and they make statements, right? So you have the expert that says this and this, okay? Now people hear that and they take that expert's word as fact. The problem here is that an expert may not always be talking based in fact. I think opinion is going to be the best example here. So say, for example, and we'll make this about skincare. Say somebody says, you know, their opinion is that Ule Henriksen is the best skincare brand. And the problem is people hear that coming from, say, a dermatologist. So they say, okay, I saw a dermatologist say Ule Henriksen is the best skincare brand. So they pass that information along and a bunch of people are going, okay, Ule Henriksen, best skincare brand. We know it from an expert. Another example of this is the appeal to false authority, which is where somebody claims to be an expert and maybe they are an expert on a certain topic, but they're not on another topic. So an example here might be if somebody is, oh, we'll say, uh, we'll say a, a foot doctor, I think that's a good example, and they come out with their own skincare line and they say, you don't need to wear SPF. Oddly specific. You know, do you really want to take a foot doctor's advice on sunscreen? I mean, they're an expert, but are they necessarily an expert on sunscreen? Mm. I tend to think that this situation happens all the flipping time in the skincare communities, and an example of this is the Purito sunscreen. So many very large influencers were saying that this is their absolute favorite SPF. They were recommending it to people, but I've always had some 
questions specifically about influencers just because you know I have this little tiny channel I have this little tiny glimpse into how this world works and I can tell you something I would never call myself an SPF expert because I'm mostly home all day absolutely don't look to me for authority on sunscreen please don't ever do it because the reality is you know I live in New Orleans since you may have heard of Hurricane Katrina since that happened all of our homes have been built quite differently they've been built to protect us against future hurricanes so there's a lot less windows in this city at least in you know newer homes so we have two windows and we have blackout curtains on both of them don't trust me to have any clue if an SPF is really SPF 50 or if it's SPF 10, I don't think I'd be able to tell the difference. So, you know, I think about that. I think about how often these influencers tend to be home and then, you know, they, they wear hats too. When they go outside, I see, I see these skincare influencers wearing all kinds of stuff to protect their skin. So, you know, can they really determine if a product is SPF 50 or 40 or 30? Can you really tell? Now, the thing is, I think this can get genuinely dangerous because we have a lot of different levels of this appeal to authority a fallacy going on here. So uh, on the one hand, you have people looking up to these influencers and trusting them to determine whether a product truly works. On the other hand, you have those influencers looking up to these companies to trust that that SPF is accurate. And you would think that you can trust that from a company. But behind the scenes, it turns out that that company isn't even actually manufacturing these sunscreens, allegedly. Allegedly, it is, you know, from a basically private labeling so they buy this sunscreen so it we're now going to three different points here to trust the lab that is manufacturing the sunscreen that is sold to the company that the influencers promote that the customer buys but what if the customer has a completely different lifestyle? What if that customer is somebody who is outdoors all day? What if it's a construction worker, anybody who works outdoors during daylight all day long? You know, at that point, that's where you have to say, this is actually, we're getting into some very dangerous territory. This is why I've been saying for years that everybody's opinion and experience is valid. You have to take every single person's experience. You can't be elevating certain people's experience over others because if somebody is a construction worker, they wear the sunscreen in the sun all day and they get a sun burn, you can't just say, well, you must have been using it wrong. Which brings us into our second topic here and that is something called groupthink. This is something that you experience constantly in this age of social media. Have you ever been in a Facebook group and somehow some kind of drama breaks out and you're saying, how, how are we experiencing this level of drama? Our Facebook group is about crocheting. Why is it so dramatic? Well, the reason for the drama is this phenomenon known as groupthink. And in groupthink, what happens is you have this community of people, and the community of people has this certain mindset. And what can happen is if anybody goes against the mindset, then the group attacks that person and says, hey, stay in line. We think this. You can't be up here thinking this. And what's so fascinating about this SPF controversy is that this was in fact going on. There were people raising concerns everywhere. There were certain influencers who were raising concerns who were silenced. There were people in the community who were raising concerns and they were silenced. So for this long run of Purito sunscreen being incredibly popular, these people were being silenced and instead everybody was going with this mindset that it has to be an SPF of 50 and PA++++. It has to be. Until somebody finally stepped in with some actual data that made all of those concerns suddenly now valid. You know, I really love the skincare community. Community. I love so much that people are gaining an interest in the sciences. Oh my gosh, I wish so much that this had existed back when I was a TA. Do you know how hard it was for me to get students to pay attention to pH? Now it's all they want to talk about. I'm frankly jealous. So understand that I love the skincare community, but I think it is so important to be aware of these biases that exist. I mean, you know, with groupthink, I see it, again, cost constantly. So for example here, you have this, this one specific mindset and somebody will come out and say, uh, but hey, I think I kind of like fragrance in my skincare. Whoa. You better back it down. You know what? I kind of think I might like 
physical exfoliants. Whoa! My personal favorite over here is when I used a retinol that claimed to be 1% and I was like, hey, I don't think this is a retinol of 1% because I've used an awful lot of retinol and this does not compare. Whoa, get back down here. It has to be the 1% that it's advertised as. I think that we as a community have got to start being aware of groupthink. We have to start being aware of questioning these percentages that these companies are giving us. You know, it's wonderful that we're getting this, but show us the data. Let me give you an example of this. I was actually thinking about this because, you know, I've, I've talked about CBD products a lot on this channel. And one thing with CBD is that these labs are incredibly good at giving you the specific lab data, the lab results on their CBD products. And what's so interesting here is that it varies from batch to batch. This is highly likely to be true with our skincare products as well, especially when you start bringing in, you know, plant ingredients, plant extracts. Are you kidding me? Those most likely have some variability because every plant in nature has its own variability. I'm going to go ahead and apply my sunscreen here, and then I'm going to tell you what I'd like to see happen as a result of what we've learned about all of this uh, SPF drama. Mm, putting mineral sunscreen on is always initially traumatizing as I see that Mark Zuckerberg picture in my mind. I'll tell you what though, I don't, uh, I don't doubt thy mineral sunscreens. I really don't. I think you, you know, <laughs> you look at this, you're like, yeah, you know, I'm probably pretty safe from the sun. I think I'm bouncing all the sun rays right back at the sun. Take that, sun. I'm a human boomerang of light. I will also be including for you all some links to the Wikipedias of these biases. I think it is so incredibly important to read up on these and understand how much they, you know, appear in daily life. Let me tell you this so honestly. My psychology undergraduate degree is the most utterly useless degree that I have, worse than my religion undergrad that I also have. But, you know, oh gosh, I use that thing daily on a practical sense, even if th this is a, a real incoming story for you. So early on in my psych program, we, we, I think this was intro to psych, one of those type of classes. We had our textbooks and we were, you know, going through it. And we flipped to this page where it's like, what you can do with the psychology degree. And it says, number one, become a fast food manager. And let me tell you, all of us in that class, we start looking around at each other and we're going, is this what you, are we, do we all want to, we, we want to be a McDonald's manager here? Is that what we signed up for? Only get that degree if you are certain you are going to go on to the master's or the PhD level. But seriously, it is so important for daily life to know about these things. Okay, I'm going to let this sit on my face for a bit and then I'm going to go in and spray all of it in about 15 minutes. But I want to also tell you what I hope happens after all of this controversy. So first off, I hope that we see widespread testing as well as retesting. Ingredient sources can change. We have to keep testing to make sure that those ingredients still match the original analysis. And I just think nothing has ever shown this as clearly as the situation. We also absolutely have to make sure that we aren't limiting this mindset to one country. I've seen so many comments that are very much bordering on xenophobia, and I've seen people also, you know, trying to uh, protest that, saying, well, it's not xenophobia, if I'm right. Okay, sure, but here's the problem. This is not just a situation of Korean sunscreen. It never has been. This has gone on in every single country where sunscreen is sold. In fact, if you want to go back way farther, back when the Mario Badescu uh, steroid scandal happened, if you guys recall that, that was years ago. So apparently Mario Badescu was selling a cream that had some steroid in it, and it was actually the Korean government who caught this. The Korean government caught a problem with the U.S product. And, you know, I think what Mario Badescu claimed had happened is that they had switched their provider of their ingredients, so they had no idea that this steroid was now being sold in their products. So, you know, this is not limited to one country. I also have a bit of an unpopular opinion. I will probably get some criticism for this if you don't hear me all the way through here. So basically, I think we need to stop demanding SPF from every brand. Ooh, hot take. And the reason this is a hot take is because so many people believe that you need to stick with only one brand for your skincare routine. Heck, I've probably, uh, you know, contributed to this because I've done so many one brand reviews, right? But the thing is, I've done so many one brand reviews. You know what I can tell you from that? Every brand has strengths and weaknesses. 
And you don't want one of those weaknesses to be SPF, which is a very critical step in your skincare routine. Plus, as long as we have this mentality and as long as SPF is as hard to formulate as it is, we are going to have private labeling and no question at all, we have it. We have brands that are private labeling sunscreens just so they have a sunscreen in their collection. And number four, I genuinely think that SPF is far more complex than skincare and I think it should be viewed separately. I really think it should be viewed as its own category. I think that, you know, if somebody's an expert in retinol or what have you, don't necessarily expect them to be an expert in SPF. It's very different. You know what? I have one more thing I want to add to this video, which I've determined will officially be a controversial video. Uh, so I talked about getting my two bachelors in this video. Let me tell you the difference when I got my master's in the sciences. So, you know, when you're at the bachelor's level of primary school, what you learn are statements. You learn a fact and then the test comes up and you, you know, have memorized that fact and you regurgitate it for the exam and if you get it right, if you memorized it, good, you get an A. The master's and the doctorate level is completely different. That's where you actually learn to critically think. So, you know, one of the first things that you learn, and I would say this was year one, you learn that you don't know everything. <laughs> you go into your master's program confident that you know what you're gonna study, you're, you think you're an expert, you know, it's the Dunning-Kruger situation. You go in with this knowledge and you're like, I already know I memorized everything, I got A's all through my bachelor's programs, and then boom, you're knocked down, you realize, no, not only do you not know anything, but also, you never will. And I think maybe, maybe know that. I think it's so important to know that people who uh, genuinely have worked in the sciences and who have been in that field for a while will always point you to another expert because that's what we learn to do. We learn our limits as scientists. I'm not going to elaborate further on this because, you know, again, I don't want this video to be about anybody in particular. My last video people thought that I was talking about very specific people, but again, I don't really watch YouTube. I'm a nerd. I sit around and read my Kindle, read PubMed all day, and also watch a lot of documentaries. Oh my gosh, I watched this really bizarre one yesterday. It was about this cult called the Children of God. Oh, I don't recommend it. But actually, I kind of grew up in a cult, so I'm always very interested in those kind of things, especially how, how other people break free of it. No, it wasn't too bad. It was just basically, if you've heard of Bob Jones University, it was that on a smaller scale. Still very odd. We had to, as women, wear dresses to our to the floor every day. We had separate elevators for men and women, separate pool times. It, it was very intense, but nothing to the level of what I watched yesterday. All right, I'm gonna wrap this up and then give you guys another long review. Why am I talking while spraying my face? <coughs> what a perfect example of how just because somebody studied something, they're not always practically wise. Have you all ever heard of, what is it, proton emission nuclear spectroscopy? Hold on. I found it. Proton enhanced nuclear induction spectroscopy. This was developed by some absolute nerds at MIT. Due to the suggestive nature of this acronym, we tend to instead call it cross-polarization. Can you imagine those nerds? They had to be over there at MIT going, <coughs> Proton Enhanced Nuclear Induction Spectroscopy. <laughs> Beavis and Butthead developing spectroscopy techniques, good lord. Have I done it again? Have I made another video that is very long? Probably. And yet I still want to talk about Dungan Bee because I like a lot going on. So that's the type of videos that I make. But this is going to be a quick review. Assuming you saw my What's New in Skincare where I introduced the Dungan Bee brand to you, I'm going to tell you right now, my opinion hasn't tremendously changed with, we're now at three weeks of using these products. But nonetheless, it slightly has changed because originally my favorite was the serum and now I actually think my favorite is the emulsion. But let me give you an overview to this brand first. And also, just so you know, these products were gifted to me and also the Think Sport was gifted to me. Okay, so Dung & Bee, this is a brand that was established in 1899. They are based heavily 
around red ginseng. And ginseng is a very popular ingredient in Asian countries. It has been used for centuries for its therapeutic benefits. There's actually an entire journal dedicated to ginseng research. So there is a lot of research. And what the research suggests is that it's a great anti-aging ingredient. We see an increase in skin elasticity, an increase in collagen production. Uh, it's rich in antioxidants. However, admittedly, anytime I'm reviewing anti-aging products, it's more difficult for me to review them. Because let's be honest here, the best way to review an anti-aging product is to uh, make the initial video and come back to you 10 years later, right? That's probably the best. Nobody got time for that, so we're just going to go with a combination of the research and talk about what I liked about using these products. Because again, this is a trial where I can't really tell you, oh yes, I'm confident that it has anti-aging benefits, but I can look at the research and say, yeah, I think it does. So the 1899 Single Essence, this is the most straightforward product. This is just the extract, although since we're talking about a Korean product, we don't know what the extract itself contains. We just know that it doesn't have added fragrance, doesn't have added alcohol, etc. It's just a one ingredient type of approach. It's a beautiful texture, that perfect, uh, you know, viscosity to it so that you can just pat it into your skin and you don't waste any. So, you know, I've gone through so little of this because of how little you need. But yeah, hilariously, the Red Ginseng Daily Defense Essence, which is in spite of its name, a serum. This was my initial favorite, and I do still really like it, but I find that it might work better for me to replace it with a BHA product because I do have acne prone skin. So this is probably gonna get moved out of the preferences for me and you'll probably see those in an empties much sooner. Actually, it's hard to say because this is the smallest quantity of these three products. I think that also partially influences my uh, thoughts on this product. Because at the end of the day, your money goes so stinking far with this red ginseng moisture and balancing emulsion. By the way, as of last night and hopefully as of today, this is $50 for over four ounces of product, but there's actually a 20% off coupon on Amazon. So we're talking $10 an ounce. Somehow this gorgeous luxury looking product with beautiful ingredients that sits well on the skin is $10 an ounce. And that's really the thing, you know, with moisturizer, I feel like I'm extra picky with moisturizer. I really want to see how they wear under makeup, see how they feel on my skin throughout the day. And this is just, it's kind of perfect and it's an emulsion. So I expected it to be too lightweight for my dry skin, but no. When you spread this on your skin, it feels lightweight, but it also feels very hydrating, which admittedly I have said, I find that to be a trait of a lot of Korean skincare products. They do these lightweight products well, so that they're still very hydrating. Do know though, this one does contain some fragrance in it. It's very light though. It's that type of fragrance where you smell it as you apply it, but it does disappear through kind of immediately. It does not linger. Uh, so yeah, this is, it's absolutely a gorgeous product. I really can't get over this. It's, it's over 4.3 ounces of product. And again, this is very heavy, beautiful packaging. $40 right now, that's, that's incredible. So this is my top pick officially, as long as you're okay with the fragrance in here. And let's go ahead and wrap up the video. If you do have any thoughts, any commentary, please feel free to add your comments to the comments section below. If you enjoyed the video, please make sure to like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.